Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Deputy Dean, David Beckett, and I'll be hosting this event tonight. Uh, I pass on the apologies of the Dean, Professor Phil Rickards, who's got another commitment in Brazil. Uh, it's very rare indeed that he's not able to host his own event, but uh, that's the way it is right now. I have great pleasure in welcoming you to the final Dean's Lecture in the 2014 Melbourne Graduate School of Education Dean's Lecture Series. I'm very pleased to say we've had an overwhelming response to this lecture with a booking out within a week of registrations opening. It's a very healthy crowd right now. I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we hold tonight's Dean's Lecture. And I pay respects to the elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation and to all the Indigenous present. I am delighted that tonight's Dean's Lecture is being presented by Associate Professor John Munro. At the conclusion of John's presentation, I have asked Professor Lorraine Graham, who leads our Educational Interventions area, to make some closing comments and to move a vote of thanks. And you will then be invited to join us for some light refreshments in the foyer outside. This will be about seven o'clock. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor John Munro. As many of you here tonight will know, Dr Munro coordinates gifted education and exceptional learning here in the Graduate School of Education. He's a qualified primary and secondary teacher and a psychologist. His teaching and research interests are in gifted education, literacy and maths learning and learning difficulties, instructional leadership, school improvement and learning internationally. John has published widely and deeply. He's written six books and over 70 published articles covering the research and application of aspects of what we often call exceptional learning. He wrote the Vell's English Curriculum and Critical and Creative Thinking General Capability for the Australian Curriculum, the Language Disorders Program, the Strengthening Provision for Students with Significant Learning Difficulties Project, the Early Literacy Pathways Literature Review Project, the Literature Review of Gifted and Talented Education of Children and Young People 2013, and the Expanded Central Gippsland Koori Literacy Project for DWCD. Not only all that, he's been a Chief Investigator leading research projects with a total budget of $1.7 million, including Psycholinguistic and Cognitive Influences on Literacy Learning, Literacy Intervention Extending the Evidence Base for Determining Effective Options, and the Effective Teaching and Learning Practices Initiative for Students with Learning Difficulties. He has led several successful school improvement projects across Australia and has produced a range of teacher resources and professional learning materials for the state and independent school systems. He's provided consultancy to several international education projects, including the Aga Khan Academies, the Hong Kong Education Department, and the International Baccalaureate. There is a new policy context. Aiming High, a strategy for gifted and talented students and young people, 2014 to 2019, was released by DWCD as a pathway to future provision. Tonight, John will talk about how the provision of appropriate educational opportunities for gifted and talented students in Australia has challenged education providers for decades. But he will also show what recent research shows about giftedness and will propose ways forward. John, you and I go way back to the old MCAE days in the Alice Hoy building. I don't know there's other people in the room now who, who can date this, carbon dating, We're going way back, last century. Um, so it's a personal, as well as a professional delight that you've agreed to give this Dean's Lecture. Please join me in welcoming John to the lectern. Uh, good evening. The context for our research uh, is the classroom. And what we've been wanting to really focus on 
uh, is what gifted knowing and thinking actually looks like in classroom interactions. I'd like to begin uh, by uh, just reviewing some of the research on uh, the provision of gifted education in classrooms. Uh, first, it's worth noting that uh, differentiating instruction to match st uh, students' approach to learning in the regular classroom is increasingly recognised uh, as an important and probably the preferred uh, uh, approach in terms of provision. Uh, as well, there is strong evidence that supports its efficacy for gifted students in regular classrooms. There's a lot of research that really supports that. And third, it's useful to note that differentiation in the regular classroom uh, is infrequent. Uh, I just want to uh, mention some research that uh, Rice reported in 2004. Uh, she looked at uh, the extent to which uh, third to seventh graders who were gifted uh, students in terms of literacy had their needs met. Less than 25% of the classes uh, in which these students sat had any form of differentiation. And so you're led uh, to ask the question, why? Why is it? that if there is research that shows that it works, if it is a preferred approach, why is it done so rarely? Now, a name that's familiar to many of us here, Joyce Van Tasselbasker, uh, in 2005, proposed possible reasons. And these were based on her work uh, in schools uh, over several years. She first of all noted that teachers uh, don't know how to differentiate the uh, traditional, regular curriculum for gifted students. Second, they often don't know how to teach these students. Third, they lack the belief that it's appropriate to teach them and uh, to, in, to differentiate the, the ways in which they're teaching. Fourth, they lack the resources, the infrastructure to do that. They lack the planning time and the resources that would enable them to actually focus on that. And fifth, and perhaps somewhat of a worry, they believe that their school leadership teams don't in fact encourage them to do that. They don't value that. And that school leaders were really unlikely to engage in instructional leadership, dialogue about how gifted students were coping in the regular classroom. You can put together uh, uh, Van Tassel Basker's uh, uh, um, reasons and those of others by identifying three key areas that really link with professional knowledge. First of all, teachers' professional knowledge, both about what gifted knowledge looks like and also what's appropriate pedagogy. Teachers' access to uh, professional opportunities within schools that allow them to engage in differentiation and also uh, leadership that sets a goal for targeting that. Now, I'd like to uh, unpack for a few moments uh, what gifted and talented outcomes might look like in a regular classroom situation. A lot of my time, uh, when I'm not here, uh, is spent on doing demonstration uh, teaching in schools. And on one occasion, I had the opportunity to be teaching a year eight class on digestion. And uh, we got as far as the, uh, the processes in the stomach when I asked the students, uh, had anyone thought of anything that I hadn't mentioned, any unanswered questions. And one student asked, how do the glands in the lining of the stomach know how much hydrochloric acid to squirt out to break down the starch in the food? I've only been teaching, as David said, I started teaching in 66, and I didn't know the answer. <laughs> we uh, talked about it a bit and asked the student to unpack why he asked the question. 
and I was, I was standing at the whiteboard and I was drawing a diagram, you know, as he was talking. And he said, well, yesterday I could eat, I could have eaten a Big Macca's and my glands would have needed to squirt out a whole lot of acid. Today I might have eaten a salad and we need much less, I need much less acid squirted out. How does the system know? Do, somehow do the eyes assess the food? Uh, are there indicators in, in the stomach that uh, tell the, uh, you know, that, that tell the other organs uh, what's going on? As I said, I didn't know. Uh, I was at the school for their next science lesson and between the two uh, lessons, three students had independently pursued the issue uh, on Google. Now, I don't think any of the students who pursued the issue would have thought of this question, but they were certainly motivated to want to know the answer as a result. On another occasion, I was teaching Pythagoras. I, I used to teach maths and science. And we'd put together C squared equals A squared plus B squared, not even drawn the squares on each of the sides. And we'd explored the, the triplets that actually make up Pythagoras. And again, I asked, has anyone thought of anything that I haven't mentioned, any unanswered questions? And one student wanted to know whether there was a tetraplet relationship. Not satisfied with A squared equals B plus C squared, are there numbers that satisfy the tetraplet? Another student had imagined not squares on the sides, but cubes. In, on another occasion when I was teaching Pythagoras, I haven't mentioned here, one student asked whether it would hold if we drew the uh, triangle on a ball or on a wave. I was teaching a grade three class about mini beasts and we went on a nature walk uh, and I turned over a stone and the uh, children saw all the slaters scurrying away. And one of the students asked, how many toes does a slater have? Now, I again don't know, it's not something I really do know. And so again, I asked the student to unpack uh, why he actually asked that question. Uh, sorry. And uh, he, he said that uh, his coach at Miniaths had told him that if he wants to go fast, he has to push down with his big toe. And then he attempted to explain how the, the speed at which the slaters were moving was really fast in comparison with their body length. Well, he didn't say it in the physics way that I'm saying it, but what he was getting at was that the rate at which they moved away really exceeded the, uh, you know, the, 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 the length of their bodies. And you know, he wanted to know, or, and then he offered some other alternatives. You now perhaps they have one big toe, do they? Or do, you know, do they, does their blood move faster? Do, 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 their, you know, do, do their muscles in their legs get energy faster? Most recently, I was teaching a, uh, and this was last week, I was teaching a, a group of students in uh, Rockhampton uh, at um, Berska Street Special, uh, at State School. And I was asked uh, as a comp reading comprehension activity to work through this particular text. Click, clack, moo, cows that type. Now the story is about some cows that find a typewriter and type a message uh, to the farmer requesting electric blankets. <laughs> now, and at one point during the session, I asked the students, why do you think the, fa oh, oh, no, I should have mentioned, the farmer refused the cow's request. Why do you think the farmer refused their request? And one student said, well, because he thought they'd get burnt. And I said, okay, well, why do you think that? And uh, he went on to say, well, you told us earlier that when electric blankets were first made, some houses were burnt. And I had. And, I also, and he said, you also said the typewriter stopped being used about 40 years ago. <laughs> and you said also that electric blankets were first made 50 years ago. So obviously it stands to reason that the cows used the typewriter at the same time as when the electric blankets were dangerous. What I'm proposing is that the thinking of these children is not typical of regular children. These, each, in each of these cases, 
the children have gone well beyond the teaching information. If we just look for a moment at the thinking that the uh, girl who, uh, who asked the question about digestion went through. She first of all extended the idea that I'd taught that uh, food is broken down in the stomach by enzymes being released from the stomach wall. And she inferred three patterns. From those three patterns, she then integrated and inferred a bigger idea. And she used that idea to link together how the nervous system worked, the digestive system, and she was also bringing in the uh, blood respiratory system. She had gone well beyond the information. She had taken the ideas and moved much further. And what she ended up with was this big picture understanding. I'd describe what she had formed as a theory about the ideas that I was presenting. And at that point, this theory was intuitive. It was personal and it had the capacity to be tested. It had the capacity to be modified in order to generate a logical or a rational theory. At this point, it was intuitive. Let's look at how uh, in, in the conventional theories of giftedness, people explain how students go about learning and coming up with outcomes like these. The uh, main model that is used in, in Australia uh, is the differentiated models of giftedness and talent. You know, the models developed by Pelleth and Heller as part of the Munich School, or the, the simplified version that, uh, you know, Gagne uh, has put together. And the argument is that children have natural learning abilities that are mapped uh, through various processes into talented outcomes. Now, I believe that our data, to some extent, suggests modifications uh, to, to this model. First of all, I'd like to suggest that uh, we talk about not natural abilities, but gifted learning capacity. Because one's capacity at any time to learn is not only determined by how you think, but it's also determined by what you know. And in addition, it's also determined by your emotional links that, that you make with the knowledge. So I'm wanting to propose an alternative, a modified way of looking at gifted uh, learning capacity and talented outcomes. I'm wanting to suggest, first of all, that students do have a uh, gifted knowing and learning capacity in particular domains, and that these domains are critically linked with particular attitudes or dispositions. And I'm wanting to agree with the, uh, the people who push the differentiated models of, gift, of giftedness and talent that we do need to also talk about the talented outcomes. But I believe that in between, we need to talk about the knowledge, the beliefs that these ways of learning generate in order to get the talented outcomes. That in fact, we need, if we're in a classroom uh, interacting with students, that we may even need to try to look for those uh, intuitive theories. We, we need to ask the dangerous questions that I ask on each occasion, what questions haven't I answered? Has anyone thought of something that I haven't mentioned? And really validate students bringing that knowledge to the uh, classroom table as a basis for pursuing the ideas further. Now, if I'm correct in what I'm saying here, if my theory is going to be supported, we need to look at what students uh, do before they begin to learn a topic, before they begin to engage uh, in learning. Can we see evidence of the learning capacity that I'm proposing? Uh, I had the opportunity 
uh, to work with some uh, year eight students uh, who were uh, looking at, it was in December 2012, and they, they were looking at, at a novel they were going to be uh, reading uh, in 2013. Some of you may have used this novel. Now, I had a group of about 20 students all together in the year eight cohort. There was about 250. Uh, and I uh, asked the students to think about uh, this text. Well, what ideas might be said in the text and what topic or theme might it deal with? I was wanting to see how well these students had been selected by their teachers as high achieving students, some of them gifted, some of them already identified as gifted, how they'd think about the text. And these are the outcomes of four of them. Now, any of us who've taught year eight will know that, that those outcomes are not typical of year eight students, particularly in December, <laughs> when it's hot, and when they need to think about uh, the, the novels that they're reading. When uh, we actually uh, videoed uh, the students' responses, and we showed them to their future year nine teachers, because those students were going to be spread across 12 uh, year nine classes. And their teachers were suitably surprised. We also had the students respond uh, to other probes, again, uh, thinking ahead. Uh, in, in a second context, I was teaching a grade four class, and we were going to do a lesson on the solar system. And I asked the students to put together what they knew about the solar system. And I collected the outcomes and most of the students told me about the planets and the, the, the moving around and uh, meteorites and all those things. And one student told us all that the moon was moving closer to the Earth. And I began teaching physics in 66 and I thought, well, yep, an interesting idea. I said, OK, well, tell us more. And he said, can I, can I draw a picture? And this is a picture that he drew on the whiteboard. He drew the sun. He drew the earth. He drew the moon going around the sun. And he said, when the moon is here, it's being pulled towards the sun and pulled towards the earth. And when the moon is there, it's being pulled towards the moon, up, uh, towards the earth and also towards the sun. Here, the forces are in the same direction. So it's going to be pulled closer to the sun, uh, closer to the earth. Here, it's going to move away from the earth. And one of the other children said, oh, I like being on a trampoline. And he said, yeah, that, that's like almost uh, oscillating as it goes around. Teaching since 66 is not the answer. <laughs> you, you don't know all the answers to these things. What was this child's thinking like? These were the reasons when I had him unpack uh, his theory th th that he gave. Again, you can see how he went about building a model of the teaching. He included a lot of ideas that were not typical of the other boys. He was coming up with ideas that uh, were not typical. So how are we looking at defining giftedness and talent? If we begin with the theories that the students are generating, first, the theories include ideas and links that are not explicitly or specifically mentioned in the teaching. And the children's theories also differ in how they organise their ideas. And there is an, a, an issue to do with prioritising the ideas. They draw out the big ideas. They make what we call far transfer. They pull in aspects of knowledge that, that, that as I said, that weren't mentioned. And so what is the thinking that actually leads to this? I've mentioned four key aspects of the thinking 
that leads to the development of these theories in regular classrooms by, by children in, focusing on the teaching that's provided. First of all, they infer links. They pull out these big ideas. They think hierarchically and they organise the ideas in more complex ways. Secondly, they engage in fluid analogising or far transfer. They, they make links between uh, ideas that weren't mentioned. They can deal with the information in much larger chunks. There's something about their thinking space that allows them to run with more ideas at once. And they're also able to engage high level thinking. You don't get these theories by thinking about the ideas in regular ways. Otherwise, all the children uh, would be coming up with them. Now, we investigated uh, in, in a more robust way uh, the extent to which students actually display <coughs> these types of thinking. Uh, so far, we've been looking at anecdotes. We wanted to uh, really engage in, in analysing uh, the data um, in, in a more empirical way. And one of my colleagues, uh, Joe Santoro, has been focusing on this for his uh, PhD. Now, what uh, Joe did was, uh, first of all, uh, identify some uh, uh, two topics uh, that grade five children would learn. And prior to the students learning those topics, we gave the children a number of key concepts. And these were concepts that were going to be uh, taught in the unit. And we wanted to see whether the gifted children would organise those concepts prior to teaching in ways that were different from their not gifted students? Would we see evidence in the concept maps that the students drew of hierarchical thinking? Would we see big ideas? Would we see more complex propositions? Would we see evidence of our transfer? Would we see uh, more uh, ideas, more inferred ideas uh, being pulled in and uh, to, uh, to identify the students who were gifted, uh, we used uh, a fluid uh, reasoning task and a uh, verbal reasoning task. So our inferences, or our predictions, sorry, were these. We were going to inspect the children's concept maps to see whether we could see evidence of those. First of all, a, an average student's concept map. We, we've got one additional inferred idea. The uh, propositions are of a particular length. Uh, I think we said two arguments, Joe, in, in a whole lot of them. Uh, we didn't have any real hierarchies. Sometimes uh, the children draw things that look like hierarchies, but they aren't. The, the items are not included. There is not an inclusive relationship with, with the main idea. We've got a concept map of a gifted student, slightly different. Still really the same basic number of concepts. In terms of inferred concepts, we had a few more. What did each strand say? We had bigger networks of meaning, bigger propositions. So the students were able to generate more complex propositions with more arguments. And they also, sorry, they showed much more evidence of hierarchies. You can see the hierarchies. You can see the inclusion you know, of, of the uh, meanings. Another gifted student's concept map. You can see the, uh, the really big picture idea. You can see the inferred meanings. You can see the explicit propositions. 
and a fourth one. So, what do we know about the gifted students' learning? We then looked uh, in, in a more uh, quantitative way at, at mean differences between the four groups of students we identified. The students who were not gifted, the students who were gifted both uh, in terms of their fluid reasoning and their crystallised reasoning, the students who showed giftedness in crystallised reasoning only, and those who showed uh, giftedness only in fluid reasoning. Now, first of all, in terms of the number of valid propositions, the globally gifted students formed more valid propositions than their not gifted peers. Uh, for those of you who do statistics, I used one way and over across the four groups of students, the four cohorts uh, for each of these characteristics. In terms of the number of uh, scientifically uh, valid propositions, uh, the, again, the uh, globally gifted students showed more uh, valid propositions than their non-gifted peers. The scientifically validated propositions were propositions that related to science. They were aligned with the topic. Uh, the valid propositions were correct, reasonable propositions, but not necessarily uh, based on science. And Joe gives the example of transfer. Uh, the the, the uh, valid propositions talk about energy transfer, whereas the, uh, the valid proposition, but not necessarily a scientific proposition, was one that talked about transferring in a car, transferring between home and work. A, a third possibility was the difference in inferred concepts. Interestingly, because I actually did expect there to be more inferred concepts, we didn't find that. We believe we understand now why, but um, at the time we didn't expect it. Uh, the number of hierarchical categories that were generated, both the verbally gifted and the globally gifted students formed more hierarchies than their, non than their not gifted peers. Now, in some ways, one would expect this because to be effective in language use, you need to be able to tap into hierarchies. We could say the text that I looked at earlier was a hierarchy. It had a topic. It had a number of discourse meanings. Each discourse involved sentence meanings. Each sentence meaning involves word meanings. And in order to comprehend a text, whether it be a spoken text or a written text, you need to be able to engage in hierarchical categorising. The number of crosslinks. We found that the globally gifted and also the non-verbally gifted students formed more crosslinks uh, than their not gifted peers. So what we've been able to see is a, a, a sort of profile uh, that is emerging uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 the ways in which the gifted students are thinking differently from their peers. Now, in summary, I've, uh, what I've listed here, uh, the t-test, the, the two-tailed t-test outcomes for the one-way analysis of variance. And uh, data that are in bold actually indicate a difference between uh, the two groups. Uh, NG is not, uh, not gifted, uh, VG verbally gifted, uh, NVG uh, non-verbally gifted, and GG globally gifted. And the non-verbally and uh, globally gifted students inferred more crosslinks. Crosslinks are to do with making far transfer. They're the, making the uh, fluid analogies. They're the one, students who are engaging in divergent analogistic thinking. They're the students who are, are creating ideas from uh, what they already know in uh, a substantial way. In terms of prioritising, 
uh, the concepts, both the verbally gifted and the globally uh, gifted students uh, prioritised concepts uh, at a high level. Uh, in terms of forming hierarchies, I'm sorry, this is wrong, um, in terms of spontaneously forming the big ideas, uh, the non-verbally gifted and the uh, globally gifted students achieved at a higher level than the um, not, not gifted students. And in terms of the complexity of propositions, again, the globally gifted students uh, formed spontaneously uh, higher level uh, propositions, both uh, ones that were valid generally and also uh, the uh, thematically uh, appropriate uh, concepts. Now, a, a second task that I mentioned earlier that, that we used to uh, investigate uh, gifted learning uh, is the uh, diffuse social problem solving task. Now, these uh, tasks uh, require students to solve problems that relate to regular uh, everyday contexts. I, I developed these first uh, when I was, was uh, contracted to set up uh, a gifted identification protocol for the Aga Khan Foundation. Uh, and it was initially in Kenya, in Mombasa. And it seemed inappropriate to use uh, Western measures only uh, to identify gifted students. And I'd known of work that Robert Sternberg had done where he had used diffuse social problem solving to identify gifted adults. And I was keen to see whether we could uh, apply the same sort of task to dealing with um, or to identifying uh, gifted adolescents. The, the agenda uh, for the Aga Khan Foundation was to identify uh, children uh, who uh, in the age range 11 to 13 uh, showed high gifted potential. Um, the, the tasks have these characteristics. Uh, I wanted to uh, see whether we could actually see the students' uh, um, d d intuitive theories about each problem uh, emerging. An example of one we've used in Australia and uh, the first one we used uh, in relation to uh, Kenya. Now, each, t each uh, solution or each student's solution was assessed uh, on a number of criteria and each of these was cued. Uh, we wanted to see how well the students could identify the main, uh, what the problem was, the solution, the actions they'd take to solve it, the information, the additional information they'd need to uh, deal with it, any obstacles they might encounter in implementing their solution, how they'd overcome those ways, and as well, we wanted the students to suggest how they'd monitor the effectiveness of their solution. Uh, the people who might be affected by your uh, solution, how you'd actually bring those people on board. Oh, and I'm sorry, I've mentioned earlier. How you would monitor the effectiveness of the solution. Uh, uh, particularly in Kenya, but also here, we really needed to help the students learn how to show their knowledge through this uh, particular medium. And we also wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't discriminating against students who uh, lacked uh, sufficient background knowledge. Now, each of those nine uh, dimensions was assessed uh, on, uh, on a two-dimensional uh, grid. First of all, the breadth and the depth of the ideas the students showed and the complexity of the thinking and so I'll just look at examples of one or two uh, of uh, these, um, uh, of the dimensions. Uh, you can see what we used to assess how well the students identified uh, what the issue was and also uh, their solution to the problem. Now, one issue that, uh, that faced us was how do we know these particular uh, tasks work? 
How do we know they actually do have some level you know, of construct validity uh, in terms of discriminating uh, gifted learners? Initially, we checked the uh, correlation between the problem solving ability and various other tasks that we used. You can see that uh, the problem solving correlated well with the Raven's progressive matrices. That in, in, that in fact, uh, there was a, a fluid uh, thinking component uh, that was involved in the problem solving. You can see as well that while the writing tasks were associated, crystallised thinking didn't really uh, correlate highly with the uh, problem solving. And thirdly, uh, that the, uh, well, we talked about uh, that correlation. Uh, in a second study, we uh, looked at the extent to which the uh, problem solving tasks correlated with performance on the WISC-IV. You can see that there was a really strong verbal conceptualization uh, correlation. Uh, in fact, it, that would suggest that probably about 60% of the variance in uh, problem solving ability was attributed to the sorts of processes that are taken up altogether uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, 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 the WISC. There wasn't nearly as strong a correlation with perceptual reasoning. And uh, one could argue whether the, 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 the breadth of perceptual reasoning tasks actually uh, measure the fluid reasoning that uh, Ravens measures. And there was also a strong correlation with overall uh, for the full-scale IQ. We wanted to look much more specifically at how um, the uh, problem-solving tasks correlated with individual subtests on the WISC. And you can see here that uh, the problem-solving was associated uh, with uh, WISC uh, subtests that assess conceptual aspects, both verbal and nonverbal. And we also uh, looked at the association between uh, performance on uh, the problem solving and the gifted rating scales. And uh, because we really wanted to see whether uh, factors such as creativity, sorry. Carmel, behave. What's the matter? I'm just happy to see creativity. Oh, okay, good, good, good girl. Okay, all right. So the 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 problem solving tasks we believe do have the capacity to discriminate between students who are able to learn and think at higher levels and those who don't. How can you be less than zero for artistic talent? As artistic talent goes up, uh, the problem solving ability goes down. I would say there was so little in common between the particular problem solving task we used and art that you'd expect that. If I'd given the students a problem that involved doing things with art or a visually focused problem, I imagine we'd find really high correlation. A negative correlation means that as one measure goes up, the other goes down. And another uh, useful aspect of the problem solving uh, is the extent to which uh, it actually measures uh, the dimension of wisdom. Now, uh, wisdom uh, is a, a really important component of Sternberg's Wix model of giftedness. Uh, and uh, wisdom in uh, uh, Sternberg's model uh, is the ability to integrate both the cognitive and the non-cognitive aspects of gifted knowing and apply them or use them 
in particular contexts. It's to do with being able to communicate your really high level uh, ability. Now, we deliberately included these two aspects in order uh, to identify or to, to see whether we could uh, assess the wisdom aspect. Now, from a, a slightly different perspective, uh, a lot of people here will know that Rena Sobotnik uh, has examined the factors that predict whether or not a gifted child becomes a talented uh, adult. And key predictive factors are not those to do with cognitive issues, but very much the uh, non-cognitive and personality aspects. And that uh, is very similar to what Sternberg is talking about uh, in relation to wisdom. Uh, and you know, the, the research that uh, Sobotnik has done uh, shows the importance of gifted students you know, learning how to communicate uh, with their peers, to share their gifted understanding uh, with their peers, and also being able to uh, read where their peers are in, in, in order to communicate uh, more effectively uh, their ideas. Now, it's, it's useful to ask uh, how do what we've just talked about extend our model further? These aspects, I'd suggest, are aspects of the long-term uh, memory, the long-term working memory, or the thinking and learning aspect. And these are to do more with the short-term working memory. And it's well established in the research that gifted students have higher working memories for those domains in which uh, they are gifted. Uh, how does our model of giftedness align with what's no, uh, known about brain activity uh, during uh, gifted uh, versus not gifted uh, learning? We're also keen to uh, look for alignments or parallels between that. Uh, for this, we can draw, to some extent, on the work of Michael O'Boyle, uh, who was you know, a former colleague here uh, in the... Um, I think in the early 2000s, Anne-Marie, early 2000s. Um, Michael uh, studied brain activity uh, during maths problem solving uh, by gifted and uh, not gifted uh, uh, um, adolescents mainly. And he showed that when uh, regular students were exposed to maths tasks, a particular network, a cortical network lights up that involves uh, three key aspects uh, of the brain. Uh, the parietal, and if it's a maths task, it's where the person's maths knowledge is, the knowledge they've learnt from sitting in maths classrooms. The prefrontal, that manages their ability to manage and direct their learning, their thinking activity, uh, their, their ability to plan and monitor how their learning is going. And the anterior cingulate gyrus, uh, that's responsible for processing the emotional aspects of performing a task, being able to deal with feedback, stay motivated to continue working on the task, and so on. <laughs> Should I call for help? John, can we call time? Uh, David, can we call time out? Okay, I'll continue. <laughs> we will continue the story. Where did I just finish? What did the regular students do? They had the network. Good, Liz. They had the network. The gifted students had the same network, but simultaneously and in the right hemisphere. Thanks, that's great. Thanks. So... We have both fired up at once. Imagine the difference in the knowledge, sorry, that this is delivering. So we have the situation, I'm just going to read uh, the description from my notes uh, about this because I, I tried to say it as briefly as I could, uh, but uh, yeah. The, the 
the, the, the gifted configuration uh, provides immediate advantages. You can see that it en enhances the management or the capacity to plan and think and organise the thinking. We have the prefrontal area on both sides operating, bearing in mind that the prefrontal on the two sides does different things in terms of managing thinking. Secondly, not only have we got the left hemisphere, what's been learnt from one's culture being used, but also one's uh, episodic knowledge, imagery knowledge, experiential knowledge of the same topic uh, being uh, lit up. As well, you can see there is an enhanced emotional engagement with the task. And many of us will be aware that gifted students invest much more in the knowledge that they form than regular students. And we, we see that uh, when we're working with the students uh, in the classroom. So this bilateral activity is going to lead to things like enhanced working memory, uh, it's enhanced capacity to think and learn and to generate unique outcomes. It helps us understand, you know, how Einstein was able to take what he was being taught, what was the conventions in physics at the time, and generate his own interpretations. And remember, they were largely through imagery, and then generate new knowledge over here. The, and there's one aspect that I didn't mention of the gifted brain, and that is the corpus callosum is much thicker, has many more neurons, and so that frees up or allows much greater transfer uh, between the two ideas. So we began our uh, discussion with the challenge of differentiation uh, for gifted learners uh, in the classroom. And I linked the low frequency uh, with a lack of knowledge of uh, what gifted knowing and uh, thinking actually looks like uh, in classrooms. Now, how is our research uh, attempting to deal with this? Uh, I, I'd suggest first that the unpacking of the uh, learning capacity allows us, uh, you know, as teachers, uh, to actually see students' knowledge. Uh, a second key aspect of this work is uh, teachers, when they know how these students go about thinking, can actually infer the sorts of understanding the students are likely to make in topics that they teach. And so they're more able to preempt where the students are going and how they're uh, learning can actually be uh, catered for. Uh, it also helps us uh, generate tasks uh, prior to uh, a, a teaching situation such as the concept mapping or the diffuse social problem solving to identify those children who before the teaching have a much greater capacity to learn uh, from the ideas. Now, an awareness of the, uh, of the intuitive theories allows a teacher to differentiate uh, their teaching while they're working with, with, with the group of students. I know when I'm uh, working with a group of students, after a period of time, and Kate and you guys have seen me do this, where I'll ask, a, a question at a particular level of demand of one child, and I might ask a, a question or a probe of a higher level of demand from another child. I can differentiate my interaction with students. I can have students who I think are learning at a high level a particular topic. I can have them try to infer much higher level ideas. But I mightn't do that of children who I don't think can uh, achieve that. What I'll be wanting uh, when the uh, higher level thinking student can provide their response is for the child who may not have been able to get that response by themselves to have a chance to analyse it and think through it 
and take it apart and uh, learn from it uh, as well. Now imagine if when uh, the student in the science class, had, when the student had said, oh, the moon moves closer to the earth, I said, oh, no, that's wrong, mate. Let me, tell, let me explain it to you properly. Let me tell you what, what it's really about. A lot of teachers really worry about the intuitive theories that the students develop. What I did with that student was actually encourage them to unpack their theory and then I gave them, him some references to pursue. And he actually did convert his intuitive theory to a logical theory. And then I had him explain, he, he made a PowerPoint and explained it to the class. And so he had the opportunity to actually learn some wisdom, to learn how to communicate his ideas uh, with his colleagues. So in terms of applying this model, we can have a real impact on students uh, learning generally. Both the uh, concept mapping and the diffuse social problem solving have a real role to play in work uh, to do with giftedness. Now, more generally, what uh, do our uh, results have to say uh, about giftedness more generally? And for this, I want to work from my notes. Now, I'd like to make the point initially that the regular differentiated models of giftedness and talent are difficult to actually apply in a regular teaching situation. They don't clarify for us exactly what it is that the natural learning abilities look like. What is it that I do as a teacher uh, in terms of fostering those? What we've tried uh, to do is to unpack the sorts of thinking that the students uh, use. And I believe that for too long, uh, gifted learning has really been embedded in intelligence. Uh, and th that, uh, and I don't want to knock that because that's part of my bread and butter, I'm a psychologist in part. But intelligence isn't what I interact with in a classroom. What I interact with in a classroom, and that's part of my bread and butter, uh, is uh, how students learn, what students know, and how they actually uh, use their knowledge. And I think debates about IQ cutoff points that have gone on for a long time and will continue to go on are really a distraction. I'm wanting to say that there are some students who are capable of uh, developing qualitatively different understanding of a topic. And if I know what to look for, I can see it. And when I can see it, I can engage much more effectively in formative assessment. I can actually uh, listen. I can look at a child's response. I can evaluate it. I can see how it differs from what I expected. And I can see where to go next with my teaching. For me, formative assessment is one of the greatest tools that I have as a teacher, whether it be working with gifted students or not gifted students. Formative assessment is what I use to decide where I will hope that child will be in 20 seconds' time. Formative assessment in the area of giftedness is rarely discussed. I actually did a literature review to try to find references to formative assessment in giftedness. I didn't find any. I didn't find any. So why are teachers not engaging in differentiation? I think we can start to see why. That we're not into the language of the classroom. We're not into the language of learners. We're not into the language of trying to understand, you know, how the children go about learning. And David, I'm aware of the time. I'm going to stop. Um, one, well, well, one minute to go. Thanks, David. Um, uh, in, in, in closing, oh, there are one or two things I, I would like to mention. Um, in closing, I'd like to mention some further activities that we're engaging in, uh, in the area of uh, gifted learning and education. Um, 
our, the research that I've presented to you today is a, a small part of a much bigger research agenda, and you, you guys know all about that. Now, we're, we're going to have a symposium that's free and, and open to anyone uh, on December the 9th. Oh, thank you. On December the 9th. Uh, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Joe and uh, Dave, Dave Camilleri and Shana, and also uh, a group of, of uh, 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 leaders of professional learning from Camberwell Primary School uh, are going to be uh, presenting uh, over this year. We've been putting in place a whole school uh, focus on enhanced gifted provision uh, at Camberwell Primary School. Um, also, uh, in January, uh, we're going to begin a revamped provision of the Masters of Education in Gifted Education. Uh, and uh, so I'd, if anyone is interested in enrolling in that, you'd be uh, more than welcome. Um, I hope you found the journey through our research, a rapid journey, uh, has been a useful one. And I thank you for your interest in attending and also my very best wishes uh, for your future, particularly in this area. really my pleasure to have the job of thanking John. I'd like to also thank you for being here today and supporting the Dean's Lecture, the, uh, the Dean's Lecture Series. It's important as an outreach from MGSE and we've had such an excellent, passionate display of uh, research and uh, also a passionate display of a teacher who is also such a great academic here tonight. So, um, I have just a few comments to make. Now, I have been aware of John's work in terms of his influential policy and also his academic work for many years. But I, I actually only met John when I took my position here in July this year. And the lasting impressions that I have that get reinforced every time that we interact are about John's warmth and also the palpable excitement that is uh, kind of in the room whenever there are discussions of learning. And that means teacher learning, it means student learning, it means research, it means John's many projects and also the projects of his students and how he mentors them and the teaching that he does with many systems and many schools. Um, it is clear why John is known in some circles as the talent. And I thank you, Gail, who's part of our uh, learning interventions team, but also has worked with John for many years in DEAST projects, for giving me that little tagline to know that John is known as the talent. <laughs> right? And I think we can oh. see... You didn't know that? Oh. Well, and it's, it's because we can see why John is such a sought-after collaborator and presenter for schools and for systems to become involved with him and his ideas, uh, which, are, which are continuous, really, and which build upon a career of rigorous research. So I should also say it's no wonder that these... Um, demonstration lessons that John also speaks about and which I have a feeling many of you have also seen in action, no wonder they work so well because students of any age plus us as an audience, we respond, we cannot resist authentic enthusiasm. That's what I believe. So. In this case, you were showing and um, you were talking about knowing with regards to gifted education. And this is such a relevant topic for us for at least 
three reasons, which I'm going to be very quick about because I know the time is, uh, is going. The first one is that this topic is so relevant, broadly speaking, and in international terms, because part of the reason why Australian scores in international assessments are not as good as they used to be is related to the performance of the top bands of students. So as educators, we have to think, what can we do to improve the performance of these students and all of the students so that the whole uh, curve of performance moves in the positive direction? So that's one reason why this topic is so important. Another one is because of equity. What John has described in the DSPS, that problem solving uh, protocol, which might be a different way of, of identifying giftedness, is extraordinarily important when it comes to the unusual suspects. Not the usual kids that you might say, hey, gifted, uh, because of certain other factors. Those kids who might come from disadvantaged schools, rural contexts, indigenous families, low SES communities, and those who may in fact need additional language or additional needs support, but still are gifted. So that's another reason why this was so important. Now I've got a third one, so bear with me. And that's because of this whole area of learning interventions which we are part of here at MGSE. When John has spoken about the importance of knowing how students know, learn and think, that is key to teachers being able to do what is vital for exceptional learners. Those learners who are exceptional in some way, whether it's because they learn easily or because they find learning extremely difficult, or because they have some individual mix of a complex profile of both of those kind of um, tendencies. What is needed is for teachers to provide responsive teaching that's based on good assessment information, informed teacher judgments, and then results in being able to use appropriate learning interventions when required. And we already know from what you have said that that happens far too rarely in our classrooms. So, boy, we have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, thank you for your patience because I have one more comment and one more connection just to leave you with. Uh, now, this connection comes from my former position, which was at the University of New England. And um, in, in 2008 at the University of New England, I started to work with uh, Professor John Geek. And John Geek and John Munro have been very close colleagues in gifted education here at MGSE for many years. And some of you might know John Geek or know of him. Well, very sadly, John died uh, in September 2011 <coughs> at the very young age of 62. And on this Remembrance Day, I would like to remember him and his connections between us and between gifted education and the topics that we're speaking about and enjoying from John's lecture so much today. And what I'd like to do is just leave with a final comment that comes from John Geek's body of work. So here it is. In a keynote address in Britain, when John was talking about educational neuroscience and learning, which was an area that he uh, followed in the later part of his career, he said, the consistent story of high intelligence seems to be, if anything, about brain interconnectivity. The more connectivity there is, and the more efficacious connectivity there is, the better. He went on to say, for educators, connectivity, joining up dots, and making ideas make sense. 
That makes sense to educators because we know that our good lessons are the ones that help students see connections and make conceptual leaps. So with that, here's to many more good lessons, good research and great lectures. Would you please join me in thanking John Munro tonight?